Welcome and thank you guys for joining us for another episode of Black Coffee and Crime, where we talk about true crime, current events, and other stuff that we find on Al Gore's internet. Uh, this week, however, we are going to talk about the scandalous, mysterious death of the best singer of all time, Mr. Sam Cooke. Um, he was murdered in a motel in 1964. The case is closed, but it shouldn't have been. So we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about things that we found in the news this week. Um, but as always, we're going to start off with introductions. My name is Brandy. We have also another Brandy. So hi, y'all. And then also Jackie is here as well. Um, disclaimer, uh, with our show, we are not law enforcement professionals. Anything like that, we're just uh, people who like to talk about mysteries and crime and things. And we talk about them in a very conversational, very unscripted manner. Um, so we'll... It's kind of like a whole gossip session around the, uh, the kitchen table. We are not here to be malicious. Uh, the things that we find and talk about are things that we find openly on the internet. Things are uh, openly available to just about everybody. So all you have to do is look and you'll find our sources and we'll also post those sources in the show notes on the, our YouTube channel. Um, so we're not trying to be malicious, especially if the people involved are family members or they are still alive. Okay, so... Yeah, sometimes it can get a little sticky with things that we talk about, but we're not trying to be malicious at all. So if we say something um, out of turn or there's information that we've missed or you would like to hear or talk about in the future, please hit us up on Instagram or Facebook at Black Coffee Crime or at info at blackcoffeecrime.com. All right, done with that. Now, first announcements. <laughs> These are the announcements as follows. Please obey your ushers and always respect your pastor because um, he yet working on us. Uh, any any new uh, business that the church needs to address this week? Fire robes. No. Mm-hmm. We noticed that y'all ain't been giving your offering. I just want to say that. <laughs> We've been passing it around. Just say y'all that. Y'all the, just been the the very, very low. They're not even, no one is, is paying tithes and giving off. I was literally like, We ain't like them regular churches that send out notices and say you can't come back if you don't pay your tithes, okay? We're not that. No. But we just noticed that y'all blessing the free <laughs> and saying we wish y'all the best, but ain't nobody giving the best, all right? <laughs> Real quickly, y'all. Just, this is so awesome. My church has went viral. What's that we, mean? That's my church. <laughs> what church? Girl. Yes, we have a segment called uh, Motivation. It's a girl that gets up and she does motivational speaking, right? About how to be better during the week. Well, her theme music to bring you in is the um, background music to T.I.'s Motivation. So one of the people that came and visited our church this past Sunday, oh, I see you, when the song came oh, on, he stood up and he just started dancing. Like he just started dancing, but like we're going to encourage that. We're going to encourage that because my pastor is big on that. We're still human and we should be able to have fun in life. Why do we have to be so uptight? Cause we believe in God. Right, so right. it's not, you don't hear the lyrics to motivation. It's the music that plays. So when I tell you, I am so shocked that we are literally about 700 shares in. It is crazy. Wait, so look, actually, I, it's I crazy. Know, that was actually your church. That's my church. Yeah. And I saw your caption and I was like, and I saw Oak Cliff and I was like, is this really Jackie's shirt? Oh man, oh boy, was he was feeling he was, it. You could just tell that, you know, like people always say, come as you are. And most yeah. people take that as your outward attire. You know what I mean? Come, yeah. you know, it's not that. It's bring me however and whoever you are at the moment. Just come in to me at that time. And you could just tell whoever he was and whoever he is, he brought that to church that day because boy was dancing his tail off. And I was like... And also, not to just be putting a, you know, but these 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 poor boys literally just lost a um, a friend, a brother. He just passed away. My pastor did their eulogy, did his eulogy, and his whole hood has been coming to our church since. That just speaks volumes in regards to my pastor um, of what kind of man he is because he's real. It, it's, you know, you're not going to come in there. If you want to wear jeans, you wear the jeans. He's like, I just want to take, just just let me try to help you be a little bit better. 
than what you are yesterday. I don't need you to come in here and fake like you've been going to church your whole life. Just let me help you. Maybe instead of, he'll tell people like, instead of smoking five blunts today, how about just two? Can we do that? Let's try just four. You know, let's just start, let's do small steps. So it's been amazing. I mean, we got the whole hood oh, out. Definitely tag Brandy in the video so she can see that. Um, Please do. He was really feeling the spirit. So that's good. So Jackie's trick went viral. Um, you know what, Jackie, go ahead and post that on our Instagram page. So I sure will. Exactly what that's talking about. So um, again, we want last last week we you know said thank you and welcome to you know new subscribers and visitors to all of our pages, YouTube, uh, Instagram, and Facebook. So we do appreciate you guys um, showing up and coming back. Um, these videos are always available on YouTube, but they drop every Tuesday on my YouTube channel. So. Uh, those are the announcements as follows. Please govern yourself accordingly. All right. So, pandemic is not over, but I think the last thing I saw was like over 200 million adults have been vaccinated in the U.S. Um, but more states are lifting the mask mandates and, you know, you don't have to wear a mask in stores, certain stores, certain restaurants or whatever. But boy, let me tell you, Whoever doesn't wear a mask at this time, even if you have a, 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 a you know, the vaccination, you still got to wear one. If you're not wearing one, something's, something's wrong with you. Okay. That's not so crazy. We are so, we're going back to normal and in the wrong way. Yes. The wrong way. Because it seems like those people who wanted to do mass shootings and all of the mass shootings that we had in like in 2000. Before that little break, we had to do a little change and some, we had some technical difficulties. But what we were talking about is those people who are, are um, were waiting in the pandemic to do mass shootings. Boy, they caught up with, their show caught up with the backlog in this past week. So a couple weeks ago, it was a shooting in Atlanta. Uh, more mm -hmm. recently, it's been a shooting in Indianapolis at the FedEx Center. Uh, uh, today is the 19th. I think there's a shooting in Austin, Texas where they kind of uh, shut down an entire neighborhood and telling people stay in your houses. All of our pages, YouTube, uh, Instagram, and Facebook. So we do appreciate you guys um, showing up and coming back. Um, these videos are always available on YouTube, but they drop every Tuesday on my YouTube channel. So uh, those are the announcements as follows. Please govern yourself accordingly. All right. Pandemic is not over, but I think the last thing I saw was like over 200 million adults have been vaccinated in the U.S. Um, but more states are lifting the mask mandates and you know you don't have to wear a mask in stores certain stores certain restaurants or whatever but boy let me tell you whoever doesn't wear a mask at this time even if you have a, 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 a you know the vaccination you still got to wear one if you're not wearing one something's, something's wrong with you okay. that's not so crazy we are so we're going back to normal and in the wrong way. Yes. The wrong way. Because it seems like those people who wanted to do mass shootings and all of the mass shootings that we had in like in 2000. All right, so before that little break, we had to do a little change and some, we had some technical difficulties. But what we were talking about is those people who are, are um, were waiting in the pandemic to do mass shootings. Boy, they caught up with, their show caught up with the backlog in this past week. So a couple weeks ago, it was a shooting in Atlanta. Uh, more mm -hmm. recently, it's been a shooting in Indianapolis 
at FedEx Center. Oh. Uh, uh, today is the 19th. I think there's a shooting in Austin, Texas, where they kind of uh, shut down an entire neighborhood and telling people to stay in your houses. They couldn't wait, I guess. Couldn't wait. Wasn't there another shooting in California? Girl, I can't keep up with. It, it, it's it's yeah, crazy. I can't keep up. A whole year, almost an entire year has gone by. We've been in a pandemic situation. And we have in a lockdown. And we haven't had mass shootings. We, you know, of course, there's there's been other incidences. But the, the rate of mass shootings, because schools have been closed, uh, malls have been closed, public venues have been closed. And as soon as the restrictions are lifted, it's they're like cicadas. They were they were they were underground, and now all of a sudden they come out like their wings are spread. Like I don't understand. And the guy in Indianapolis, the FedEx guy, um, he had been denied purchase of some guns, and then he went and bought them anyway and killed eight people. But we all, you know, we want to protect our Second Amendment rights no matter what. We can't put restrictions on the type of guns. Uh, I'm just a person that I don't believe that anybody needs an AR-15 or an automatic assault rifle in their house. I just don't. Okay. I'm not saying you shouldn't own them or, you know, but you need to have a special license to have something. Yeah. Like you need to go through mm -hmm. some additional training, have a special license for that. <laughs> And make sure that you have the the right um, training and um, storage for that type of a weapon because it's unnecessary. People, everybody I know, and I know people who have these guns, and they're like, "It's for my protection." What? 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 You need to ramble people just on, on a just on a Tuesday. Right. And while it might be for your protection. Are we living in an apocalyptic situation? Right. You know, like, is it that, you know what I'm saying? I, I don't get it. Well, they think it's going to be one, so. Pretty soon. Yeah. But we're not there yet. And it's scary right now for me to even think about, like, now, after a whole year of most, you know, people dying uh, of this virus, that now you have to go back to the situation where, you could be in a grocery store and someone's going to shoot. You could be in a church and someone's going to shoot. You could be in a school and someone's going to shoot. We didn't have to worry about that for an entire year. And now that worry is back for most of America. Yep. You know, most of America. Um, and we're back to the situation where we have police shootings. I don't think they ever stop. But you have the, this, my dog is over there slipping water, y'all. Or trying to flip water. You have the, this this tale of two Americas where young white men can go out with an assault rifle and shoot multiple people. And we talk more about saving gun rights in that situation than the victim. But then yeah. you know, a young black man, you want to talk about, especially Adam Toledo, who 13 year old who was shot by police last week. You want to talk about he deserved it because he had a gun in his hand, a handgun. 13 it. years old. Make this make sense, people. Make this make sense. You talk, you want to talk about Philando Castile, who owned a gun legally, said that he had a gun and was still shot by police. So let's not talk about this as about gun rights or anything. This is just the tale of two Americas. And unfortunately, it's just an ongoing story. So um, what else we got on uh, Al Gore's internet this week? Uh, Brandy, you found a story about a guy messing with the mafia and it didn't turn out well? Yeah, what was his name? Uh, Mr. Harris. Uh -huh. He was a, a school teacher. He and his brother-in-law decided that they was going to rob the cartel. So they go over to the... Oh, they're to both. The part ...to go, uh, you know, to go steal what they were going to steal and got caught by one of the guys and he would not give them the information that they were wanting. So they shoot him um, point blank uh, execution style. And then, you know, you're in a trailer park. So everybody's gonna hear a gunshot. All of a sudden it's a, this big shootout. 
and um, Mr. Harris, I think that's what his name, right? Mr. Was, Harris? Yeah. Cause he was a teacher. Yeah, he uh, ended up dying even though he had a bulletproof vest on because he didn't have the correct bulletproof vest. But his brother-in-law survived. Now, my thing is, what makes you think you're about to go against the cartel with you and your brother? Like, what was going through your mind? What kind of desperate situation were you in that you saw? Yeah. You would rather go against the cartel than deal with this. <laughs> he, didn't no, he didn't have no money he was a, a track coach and um some other type of coach and i think might have been a spanish teacher or something like that i mean that's still bold like i wouldn't dare okay. i mean we got these teachers and more they, pay he did teachers better more. i don't know yeah we definitely got to pay teachers more teachers don't get paid enough yeah. breaking bad like i don't know this, yeah. this, this is not this is not that like you had a bulletproof vest, but you didn't have the kind that the cartel uses because you don't know what kind of firepower the cartel uses. And you're shooting folks. In, how thin are mobile home walls? First of all, you went into a mobile home park. There's one way in. One there's way out. There's a lot of little streets, but the same entrance is, is your exit. Mm -hmm. Where would you going to go? Man, he said they ain't paying me enough over here at this school. I got bills. I got these kids. He didn't think bank first or corner store. You, he would have been better trying to rob a bank. The uh, cartel. Uh, and hiding the money and got out of prison in five to 10 years. And once once you hide the money and they can't find the money if you were convicted just for robbing the bank and they never find the money, the money's yours. The Mexican cartel. And here's the thing, the brother-in-law that survived, he might as well just kill himself now. Yeah, because they're going to keep coming. They're going to get him. They're going to get him, the dog, mm -hmm. goldfish, mm -hmm. and they might get the neighbors too, just because they live there. Mm -hmm. Look, quit messing with folk, with folk money. It don't belong to you, especially if you mess with the cartel. Mm -mm. But you don't come with just two folk. <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> that too. Yeah, with just two people? What just two criminal credentials did these guys have? To where they thought that going against the cartel was going to be the best yeah, solution. The best solution. Best. <laughs> <laughs> like who who convinced the other? Like who was who who was the mastermind behind this and said this is a good idea? We could do this. Clearly, none of them was smart at all. Even though he was a teacher, I mean, I don't know what he was dumb as a box of rocks. I mean, they rocks at Seven Eleven. You know, the ice cream man, um, the cartel? Anybody. So, but cartel. the cartel. Anybody but the cartel. Oh, see. we just can't believe it. We can't believe it. He was such and such and such. Well, he did now. He did. That brother gone. With the wrong bulletproof vest. That brother gone. Now, I found a story... And I got this from uh, Illicit Deeds. Um, and you can find them on Facebook. I love their page. Me too. Uh, this, did you see the story, Jackie? It says, man charged for having sex with horses somewhere in San Antonio. I did not. What's going on with your people? Girl, this is Texas. Everything goes to Texas. Um, not go big. He really went big. Says that... Uh, uh, the suspect was 24 and he was caught on surveillance cameras last June walking through the stables naked. Uh, he was going in and out of different stalls. Um, Young man. So he's going out in and out of different stalls. Um, the next day after he was caught on, on camera, the owner, this is from the story of the list of these. This is, um, this is I'm quoting this. The owner noticed two of his horses Okay, so the owner noticed two of his horses both suffered leg. <clears throat> I'm going to say that one more time. The next morning, the owner noticed two of his horses both suffered leg injuries. What the hell was he doing with the legs? Yeah. I know we all get a cramp every now and then, but 
said the vet determined that both horses had been sexually and physically assaulted and DNA was collected from one of the horses. Did he get his last check? <laughs> I'm saying like, but what the hell did he do with the legs? To where it was, were they injured? Like, what did you do with the legs? Like, what? 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 Where did you come over there? Um, <laughs> uh, wow. Um, <laughs> what? Okay. Uh, I mean, is he? I have no idea what could have happened to the legs. I mean, my my, I'm, my 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 mind is pretty vivid, and I have a very good imagination. I just want to say that if he injured a horse, <clears throat> he no what he was going to do to a human, female or male. Maybe he nasty. I, I just need to know what happened to the legs. Do we have? <laughs> That's really it. <laughs> That's really it. I just want to know what happened with the legs. Like, what happened? How? We have them doing the splits or something? Well, okay, horses, some horses, most horses sleep standing up, okay? So I'm imagining it now. Listen, I'm just going to, this is logistics. Most horses sleep standing up, okay? So he would have had to get some kind of a stool or something to get behind the horse. No, he pushed that back down. <laughs> Why does he have to say that? <laughs> And them legs was out too far. See, now I understand what happened to them legs. Horse ain't supposed to do no splits. You know, they only go out too so far. <laughs> push that back down. Oh, my God. Legs spread too far. Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> That's what happened. See, I just figured it out. I just can't imagine... Like being the owner of the barn and going in there and seeing your, like, you know, you see a naked guy in the stall, you're like, what the fuck is he doing in there? And then you go in there and you got an injured horse and then you do a DNA, collect DNA from a horse. So it was fresh. You had just been there, not been there not too long. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I, again, I just worry, I worry about whoever that, that man had been with sexually prior to the horses, because, I mean, are there any, were there any reported? Because uh, horses uh, normally kick, like. They can't kick if their legs are spread out. They, <laughs> so it, 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 it doesn't say in the article, it doesn't say whether or not he worked there. Or, he, you know, was he familiar with these horses? How did he get on the ranch? He had to have worked there. Yeah. Um, yeah, it doesn't say, but you can speculate that he had to work there for the horses to be uh, comfortable enough with him, with him in mm -hmm. their stall to get behind. Yeah, he didn't get his last check. No. No. They're going to need him to return his uh, all the equipment that they gave him and don't come back. <laughs> mm -hmm. Unless they don't return it. We just don't want to see you in a while. No, well, you need to get that uniform back. Oh, we don't want that. Yeah, you can keep everything. First of all, okay, let, let, let's just think. The back end of a farm animal. There's nothing clean about that. Nothing. Ain't nothing clean about him, clearly. And you went in there? Like, for why? Could the... the mm, mm. 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 Oh, it's making my stomach hurt thinking about it. Oh, that's nasty. Did he just get on the leg and start humping as hard as he could and just the poor thing got injured? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to, first of all, he just, it's, it's nasty. It's so nasty. I really am because horses can't, I mean, what kind of way did he do splits, Brandy? Because horses can't do splits. <laughs> I'm just saying. Maybe the back they fanned out? I don't know. I mean, could it have fanned out some way? Okay, that so is, they see him going in and out of other stalls. It doesn't say they saw him with a stool or a ladder going in and out of other stalls. They just said a naked man. So he done took the clothes off where he even came on the scene. Right. He didn't want no hindrance. He just. They said he had on, on a, a, a red Target polo shirt and khaki pants 
he didn't want them to be able to to <laughs> I know that for him to already be on he had a Walmart vest on. Did you say it was a female and a male horse? No, no, no. Uh, it didn't say. Um, Does it matter, Jackie? It's even well, grosser if it's a male. Female. You would feel better if it was a female horse? No, I'm saying it's grosser if it's a male. It I matter. think it's pretty it's gross female. across the board. It's just, it's brutal. It's disgusting. But a male, I'm sorry, just a little bit more disgusting. I, it's, it's more. It's it, more it, disgusting. It's more disgusting. It's pretty gross. It does not matter to me. I wouldn't know no way. You, you just stick wherever you could stick. Probably was dark too. He didn't know he was who he was sticking. Just bad. This is bad. Period. I don't care if it was. A <clears throat> you know, in Mexico they got the donkey show. Why do we have? So my um, husband, he's still he he don't know no better. He first started driving trucks and. <laughs> They were like, you got to come to this show. Like, it's like, it is literally a headliner in Mexico. It's a headliner. Mm -hmm. uh, people go for yeah, that we, show. We he, said they open, he said he walked in there and them, that stuff, it, things started. He was like, I had threw up right there on the table when I left. They have those same shows in Arizona as well. <laughs> That's not against the law in Arizona? It is. Because it's bestiality. But they have the shows. It's like secret. Yeah. How, you, how you get warmed up for something like that? Oh, <laughs> oh God! <laughs> oh, chill, <Ooh. laughs> Jackie. Ooh. I mean, do you have a doctor on hand with stitches, like sutures, ready? Because oh, I mean, more. after you do it a couple times, you might not need. Ugh. Ugh. How do you pee after that? How do you it's live? Strange. How do you pee? And I bet they don't want to get the COVID shot too. Right, because I don't know what it is. <laughs> 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 so true. <laughs> Uh, recording, uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> she was saying something just be off for a while. Okay. <laughs> oh man, that's so great. That experiment. Oh, oh Jesus, it's so true though. That's why it's so funny. I guess because it is so true. Yeah, you do some questionable stuff or like. I'm not taking that shot because I don't know what's in it. Like you smoke, you just smoke in a dog house. You, you. <laughs> I just saw you sucking in an alley, and you said talk about you were gonna take a cold shot. You put <laughs> take this shot. You put me like yeah. You know, people crazy. That shot. Don't even worry about that. Yeah, that's the last thing you should be worried about. That's the very last thing. As a matter of fact, you should protect yourself even more. <laughs> I can't with y'all. I can't with y'all. So that's what we do on this show. We start off well. And then we start <laughs> it, it always goes south. It goes south. Completely unraveled. Okay. So this 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 next story is about to go real, real. It's going to be a downhill slalom, y'all. Um, we're going to talk about Sam Cooke. Uh, Sam Cooke is arguably the best voice that anybody has ever heard. Mm -hmm. uh, you can argue with me, but you won't win, okay? Um, but in 1964, in 1964, Sam Cooke was shot in a motel in Los Angeles, California. Mm -hmm. The case went to trial or to a coroner's inquest within five days. And the woman who shot him was basically acquitted and they closed the case. 
So this is a closed case, but the circumstances surrounding this murder are so questionable that it should have never been closed. It was not investigated at all. And we're talking about an international superstar in 1964. And so we're yeah. gonna talk about the scandalous and mysterious murder of Sam Cooke. Um, so I guess we'll start off with just like a little bit of background. Uh, Brandy, if you could just, you know, give some information about, you know, how he started, who he is. I'm <laughs> like, he, he was a teenage, uh, <laughs> Singer, a uh, gospel singer with the Solsters. He um, was very popular uh, in very popular gospel group, and they say that um, he built up a you know the group built up a big following, and the women or the girls would just go crazy. The girls would love him. The guys wanted to be him, and um, you know they were like superstars, but they were gospel singers, and they would sing on the the gospel. The um, Chitlin Circuit and travel, travel around, and um, Sam decided that he wanted to branch out and, you know, do a little bit more with singing and um, start singing secular or worldly music, as the church would call it, under the name Dale Cook. But mm -hmm. one knew who he was because cannot deny that voice. Yeah, and deny that voice, baby. Yeah. Of, um, I read an article from uh, NPR, and it was talking about a book, but it was a it was excerpt from a book, and the, the article is from two thousand um, six called "Tracing the Highs and the Tragic End of Sam Cooke." But in this book, and I'll have to put the name of the book in the description. But in this book, they talk about how ambitious he was, even as a little kid. Like he mm -hmm. said to his brother Elsie that he didn't want to work; he was going to be a singer. Yeah, he didn't want a regular job. Yeah, he yeah. was like 19 years old. He automatically knew he was going to be a singer. Mm -hmm. He also knew that there were people out there who sang better than him. Like when they would go to like different churches or whatever, um, he knew that people would sing better than him. And one of the person that sang better than him was his dad, who was a preacher. But it never stopped him because he knew that he had something else. Like he was the one that was drawing the crowds because they wanted to see Sam Cooke. Um, so one of the groups that sang better than him was soldiers and they recruited him to be a part of their group sure did. super ambitious um and that also played later on in his life with him you know being a producer a record label owner and all of that um so once sam gold secular uh the first song that he what was the first song that he did under dale cook it wasn't send me was it uh -uh, mm -hmm. that was it was something send me is what sent to you know sent to me but it wasn't it was something wonderful or something like that in 1959 um, um i forget I, the, the song is on i know the song but i can't think of it right now it was a, it was the, the song that he basically uh sampled was a gospel song and he just changed some words to it right so you you know so he he was very close to his gospel roots and you can still hear that in all of his secular music you can still hear, you know, those those rhythms. Trump did that too, and you know they're saying, "Oh, you changing this, uh, you know, God's music into the secular because he, it's he played it the same. It, you mm -hmm. know, he brought that into so did so did Sam Cooke. Yeah. Yeah. I remember saying when he was in the group with his with his siblings and uh, the singing children. I think they were called. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, he he was he was one of the younger ones. Um, so he didn't really sing a lot, but then when he got recruited to the Soulsters, I think when um, the lead singer left, he sang a solo, and they were blown away because they never let him sing lead. No, when he was a kid, he never sang lead. <laughs> yeah, they they never let him sing lead, so they were like, "Wow!" Like, you know, they, his brother, his older brother, his oldest brother Charles sang lead. His brother mm -hmm. and his sister Mary they sang lead. And that was they like they played their roles, you know, like you didn't move up until somebody left the group. Um, and his brother apparently was they could all sing, uh, but his brother Charles was like he never once he left that group he was never gonna sing again. Like he didn't want to do professional or whatever. Um, but yeah, they you know he he didn't he didn't sing lead. They didn't know he could sing like that. Um, and one one of the uh, uh, things that I read was that. His father invited him up to sing one at a, you know, during church. And he told his dad, I don't, I don't want to sing, you know, I don't want to sing next to you or whatever. 
So the dad says his father should go ahead and he's saying, and Sam really starts to take it home. Like he, you know, he's about to show out. And then his dad is like, mm -mm, mm -mm, it's my song. So then the dad like takes over and he shows up, you know, he, you know, he takes over and he shows out. And I guess after the, after church or whatever, and, you know, they had like a little joke, like, you know, his dad said, no, you ain't gonna out sing me on my song. You know what I mean? <laughs> In my church. In my church. church. So, you know, it was a family, it was a family thing. And his father, even though that he was a uh, very religious, um, he actually supported Sam's career. He, he supported the fact that Sam wanted to sing secular music. He's like, if this is what you want to do, um, then you do it. Um, his father was ambitious as well. When they left Mississippi, he went to uh, Chicago, got a job, brought his family, uh, and step by step, he moved his family out of the, you know, out of basically tenements and hoods, and you know, got a house in I think with Bronzeville, and then he got a church in Bronzeville as well. And so his father was ambitious. He had limousines. He, you know, so he, you know, he definitely passed that that level of, of ambition and success to his kids. Now, getting to the part where from 1959 when You Send Me comes out into 1964. In six years, after You Send Me comes out, Sam never fails to be at the top of the charts. Every single song that he put out was at the top of the charts. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, nowadays, it's easy for artists to, to put out a song with social media and digital music and hit the top of the charts immediately. But they don't have the longevity. Very few artists right now have longevity. But you're talking about 70 years ago, 60, 70 years ago. And this is a black man with natural hair mm -hmm. singing gospel sounding music. Mm -hmm. in state, and he's at the top of the damn charts every single time. This made him loved and this, is ma this made him hated because he had already moved to LA. Mm -hmm. uh, and he moved to LA and I don't know if you guys know I, the LAPD was, is one of the most racist or has been one of the most racist institutions as far as law enforcement and uh, the police chief hated black folks he hated black folks and this is one of the reasons why his murder was never investigated because of that police chief so you know he's very popular he worked for uh, what was the guy name? It was guy's name was Dolphin uh, a gentleman with the last name of Dolphin. He worked for him, who in Dolphin wanted, Mr. Dolphin wanted to have a- Dolphin, wasn't, Hot, a, wasn't that the name of his club? Dolphin, what was it, Brian? Dolphin uh, of Hollywood or something like that? Yeah, something like that. He wanted a, um, he yeah, wanted a club, club. club, but they wouldn't let him have a club because he was black. So he had a record store. And also in the back of that record store, they would have singers and stuff like that. So. Sam was there, he cut a record. They used to have a DJ come in and broadcast live. And that's how Sam Cook got out. Yep. Sam Cook got out. And then after that, everybody wanted Sam Cook. Um, Brandy, you were saying something about um, no, it was in the uh, the documentary, The Lady You Shot Me, where Mr. Dolphin's grandson was saying how the police would yeah. take people from going to that store. Like they would literally stop them in the street and like they knew where they were going and tell them, the women, if you go over there with the black people, they're gonna rape you. Gang rape you. They're gonna gang rape you. Uh, anything to keep white kids from going to, these, to, to the concerts and to the store. Um, of course, there was no gang rapes. There was no violence. There was nothing because um, uh, the black people, we don't, we don't, we don't, we are welcoming of just about everybody. Uh, if you enjoy our music and if you enjoy our culture, which is why it's so easy to appropriate Black culture, um, if you enjoy our stuff, then you're then you're fine. You're welcome. You know what I mean? Because it's it's free to everybody. We're we're open to everyone enjoying um, our culture. Um, but yeah, so Sam was super popular, and it, it started, even when I talk about that record store, I always like I started envisioning. I could see like all the black people crowding around in there. I could see people having a good time. And I immediately was like, dang, I bet they was, but it was lit. <laughs> I right. bet it was lit up in there. If you got white, you, you know, you got white people coming down in your neighborhood on the south side who had no business to be over there, 
right. they want to be a part of that scene so bad because it's so amazing and it's so so um cultivating that they're willing to risk the police telling them all these lies it didn't even stop nothing they still and came the down location it had to be super lit. is in current south central los angeles at the time it was called the central district but it's south central um so that's that's where that would would have been in south central los angeles yeah which you know, was already becoming a black neighborhood because people, you know, black people were moving in droves to uh, to Los Angeles, and when the black people moved in, the white people moved out. Yep. Um, and it's crazy because now all the white people are trying to move back in. Um, so places like Compton are now called what South Dominguez Hills or something like that. Um, it's like that, it's so, like that here in Texas, um, yeah. South Dallas, which is was a more common black area it, they're trying to move them out like they're putting up high rises they are putting in building these extravagant restaurants right in the middle of the hood and trying to get them straight out of there they build a new house they're trying to get them like let's push you somewhere else they're you trying to take it and then you complain about people people doing hood shit this yeah is, we this do is the, this is what they got this is they spot you know we you want to complain because you can't you know gentrifiers they come in and they want to complain because they can't go to I can't walk to the store. I can't walk my dog to the store. Why are you walking your dog to the store in this neighborhood anyway? We could have told you don't not do to that. take your ass over off of Malcolm X. Uh, don't do that. that. <laughs> don't do that over there. We could have told you that. Don't do that. You're going to get robbed yeah, or something. Stay off of MLK after after dark. We could have told you that, but you didn't listen. Because you want to be a gentrifier. You, you don't want anybody to tell you what not to do. And that's why you got busted in the face. And your dog got took. And your dog's got your dog's taken. Cause they go take that motherfucker back because he's cute. <laughs> <laughs> Cause your right. little Yorkie is out of her. He's out of her. They gonna the Yorkie, see it. The Yorkie is sleeping in the same bed as my pit bull. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Promise you. All right. So let's go ahead and get to the good part. Okay. So Sam is twice married. Uh, his first wife. Mm-hmm. He was married to her for a few years and from like 1953 to 1958. He was really young. Uh, really young. He They get a divorce. She actually uh, moves to Fresno, California from Chicago. And uh, she's in a car accident the next year after they divorce. He does pay for her funeral. Then he marries in, um, he marries Barbara Campbell, who was his wife when he passed away. They have three children. One of those children was born in 1953. He was married or about to get married to his first wife, Dolores. I had to go back and dig. I was like, wait a minute. Linda was born, his daughter Linda was born in 1953 and he was married to somebody else in 1953. But Sam was a ladies' man, okay? Sam was a ladies' man, which led to his death. Uh, so he, he and uh, Barbara have three children. Uh, Linda was born in 1953. Tracy born in 1960, and Vincent, who was born in 1961, but he died of a drowning, a drowning death in uh, 1963, so he died as a toddler. It's also reported that Sam had three other outside kids. So Sam was, Sam was, you know, doing he his thing. Sam. Sam was doing his thing. He was cooking. He was cooking. Mm-hmm. Sam was cooking. So, you know, <laughs> uh, he started to, you know, really go in and get into producing and owning the rights to music. Um, one of the groups that he one of the groups that he produced was called the Valentinos and that was a group full of Womacks most notably Bobby Womack and we'll come right back around to Mr. Bobby Womack in just a minute so the night that Sam died he went to dinner with his, one of his producers and the producer's wife and they were supposed to meet at a party later. Well, Sam, they leave, the couple leaves. Sam goes to the bar. He starts talking to this lady. Uh, they see him talking to this lady. Um, he leaves with her. He goes to another location. People see him with this mysterious woman. Uh, they look like they're being very quite cordial with each other. There's, you know, there's no um, sense that, you know, there's any tension between the two, Sam and this mysterious lady. Well, uh, Later on that night, he does not show up at the party with his producer. So the producer goes home. Um, but he does go to a motel. He gets a reportedly he gets a call. Now his 
His assistant, Zelda Sam, says that Sam was called to that motel, the Hacienda, the motel Hacienda, all through the world. And he was called to the hotel, but he doesn't, she doesn't say who called him to this motel because one of the parts of the mystery is that Sam was very particular. You know, this mm-hmm. is a, guy who a very certain way. He didn't grow up poor, even though they were from Clarksdale, Mississippi, they didn't grow up poor. So he had an air about himself. He had about $5,000 in cash in his pocket, but somehow he ends up at a CD motel. And mm. that was one of the mm. things that people said that that wasn't right because yes, he would take women to hotels, but it wouldn't have been, always nice. Nice. Mm-hmm. it would have been a very nice motel. Like mm-hmm. that wasn't even part of his, you know, at this time he was living in an all white neighborhood. He was the only yes. black person in that neighborhood. Yeah. So they're like, that's totally off of his character. Um, apparently his alcohol level at the time of his death was twice the legal limit. So he was quite drunk when he died. Well, the story that is, that was told by Alyssa Boyer, who was the woman that he left with, she was a prostitute. Uh, she said that Sam got her in the room. She told him to take her home, but he took her to his motel instead. And he said that he threw her on the bed and was taking her clothes off and he went to the restroom and when he left to go to the restroom she gathered all of his clothes and ran across the street to in front of a diner and called the police you know she tried first she tried to knock on the door of the motel manager the manager didn't answer so she ran across the street to a diner to use the payphone and she called the police from there Sam reportedly comes out of the bathroom. He doesn't see her. He's angry. He puts on the blazer and one shoe because that's all she left him. And he goes and he bams on the door of the hotel manager demanding that she let him in and where's my girl? He gets in. Listen to what I'm saying. He gets in. She opens the door. She lets him in. There's a fight. She grabs her gun and she shoots him three times. Then... She grabs a stick, a broom handle, and beats him. And then she calls the she's she reportedly on the phone with the motel owner at the time of the incident. So the motel owner heard the scuffle and also heard, heard the gunshots. She's the one that called the police and said that there was a possible shooting at her motel. Even and, and keep in mind the shooting didn't kill him, supposedly the broom did. When they found him, and there is a photo very grainy photo of Sam. Mm-hmm. And he slumped over. Mm-hmm. Uh, they said, which is not in the official corner report, but they said that he had been beaten so severely around the head and neck that his head was almost separate. It was basically on his shoulders. And that and if you see a picture of Sam in the casket, there is no way that he should look like that in that casket if it was a gunshot wound. There were gunshot wounds only to the chest. He looks, and I hate to say this, he looks horrible. And yeah. he does not. I've been to funerals, and I've been to funerals of people who have had gunshots um, to the face. And that's the way Sam looked as if they had to do major repair on his face. Um, his, you know, and in death photos and, you know, casket photos, people, you know, they're kind of like this. There is no elongation to his neck. Like you don't see his neck at all. You see shoulders and his head basically sitting on his shoulders on yep. in that casket. Um, again, that is not an official court report about what, you know, the, the other injuries are not in there. But there are there are people who were in that room uh, who saw him who have said what he looked like uh, at the time of death. Now, the lady who killed him was fifty five years old. She said that they fought. Yet five days later, five days after Sam Cook is dead, they have a coroner's inquest. Bertha Franklin is the one who shot him. She had no. Mm-hmm. Visible injuries. None. But supposedly he was wrestling with her. 
oh, over the other. Well, she didn't have none, nor did the prostitute. <clears throat> Yeah. And even even watching her interview uh, talking about what happened, she seems completely unfazed. She's like, I uh, shot him. She's like, I shot him. Yeah, I shot him twice. They missed. I shot the third one. It hit him. And then he got back up and chased after me. So I picked up a broom handle and I start hitting him with it. That's how she says it. Literally just like that. You just and I'm like, the, the most popular singer in the country. And you are not shocked, phased, a saddened within five days. Like you've completely got over the shock of having to do this and yep. having to And now, she was only like 20 pounds heavier than him. Yeah. That was it. I mean, he was still the, the more dominant sized. But remember what taller. I said. She was like, what, five, three, five, four? His alcohol level was twice the legal limit. He could not have fought with her the way she said that he fought with mm -hmm. her. Yeah. Exactly. And why would you drop the gun? Because of, reportedly the gun had more bullets in it. So mm -hmm. why are you going to drop a gun with more bullets in it? Pick up a broom. And pick up a broom. And and the, the the bullet that was found in Christian's heart, the bullet that was found in San Francisco was a 22 caliber bullet. Yep. Bertha didn't own a 22. You didn't own a gun like that. <laughs> no. She didn't even own that. Nope. Just complete fraud. And this is jumping way ahead, but I think they had got in contact with the Asian prostitute girl and they said she had dementia or some, you know, something like that, but they asked her about the, the shooting and she verbatim said her testimony that she had given five days after his death word for word and this is down the line after she's old and everything she said the same like rehearsed like exactly what she said when she was on um the stand giving her testimony wow that means she's lying because no exactly. one exactly the exact same way even if, if I'm telling the truth, I will tell the story, but it's going to be in a different cadence. It's going to be in a different way. Um, I'm, I might give the facts one time. I might Sometimes I might give details about what was on the wall. But my story is going to change slightly. But if it's a lie, you have to keep to the lie. Now, I don't know if y'all know this, but in 1979, that same prostitute was convicted of second-degree murder for a shooting. I don't know if that has anything to do with anything, but that's really, really crazy that yeah. years later, crazy. years later, she's convicted of murder. Um, in any case, neither her or Barbara Franklin had a lawyer at the inquest. How are you accused of murder and you don't no, have a lawyer? It's crazy. Were you even arrested? There's no. I don't there's think she was. There's nothing to say that she was ever arrested. From mm -hmm. her, they just said, and the the when they went to court, it was a coroner's inquest. It wasn't necessarily a trial; it was a coroner's inquest. And at a coroner's inquest, they used to have these, um, like in medieval times, and even like you know, in the last few centuries, to have a coroner's inquest because a coroner is an elected official. So the coroner would basically gather the evidence and say, "Is this a murder? What happened?" Uh, and they were like a grand jury. The, the coroner's inquest used to be like a grand jury to determine whether or not this should go to trial, what happened, was the death, you know, uh, justified, you know, all of those things. So basically that's what they had, but you can still have an attorney at a coroner's inquest. In the mm -hmm. coroner, we already know he was crooked because he didn't put nothing about him getting beat. No, no. Right. The LAPD did not investigate. The FBI did not investigate this murder did not investigate this murder. And we're um, talking a big, we're talking big, famous, he had literally was just on Dick Van Dyke's show prior to, well, it not Dick Van Dyke. Um, uh, 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 Mary Van Stan. Yeah. Literally a couple of days prior, he was, already had sold millions. We're talking 1964. His, millions. His first in hit 1954, sold in 1959 sold a million records. But that's crazy. That's, and, that's, crazy. Coincidentally, Mr. Dolphin, who owned the record store that he worked at, 
he had also been shot. Right. Um, year, a couple years before by, uh, so by a guy who um, was recording records and his records never really took off or whatever. So he was disgruntled and he shot and murdered Mr. Dolphin. Uh, Mr. Dolphin's grandson is like, it's too much of a coincidence that both of these men who were hated by the LAPD and who were uh, really trying to produce black music and, and, and be businessmen and entrepreneurs when it came to the music industry, that they would die under such mysterious circumstances. Well, then they also had that, um, um, they were thinking that maybe Alan Klein, which was one of his business partners might have had something to do with it because right after uh, Sam passed, well, I guess him and Sam had some words about something with the contract and because Sam was all about owning his own music and you know, producing and, and all of that. And uh, <clears throat> now all of his recordings and stuff, all, you know, you can't, right. you can't really do anything on Sam Cooke without Absco, which owns all of his music. And then yeah. they were saying, I think it was it his uh, assistant Zelda? Was saying that she had told him, do not mess with this guy. You know, he's he's done a lot of people wrong. Don't do the Rolling Stones wrong. Like these major white groups, he had already, he, he basically would ink a deal with them to where he would manage them for a certain amount of years. And mm -hmm. they would get so much money up front, so much money in royalties. But he was so slick with it that he, he would make it impossible for them to move to a different record company. Or you know, or or not manage them anymore because they were under these really strict and tight contracts. Um, now, yes, and also trying to get the rights to their music, get, getting you know, literally having if you're not business savvy, you know, you you just write off. Sam Sam was though. So Sam was right. No, I'm saying in regards to the other yeah. group. His, his contract stuff. wasn't that he sold the rights to his music to Apple. Right. To it wasn't that he was just managing him. What happened after Sam's death is his wife sold his music to Alan Klein. So yes, he had a certain amount of of uh, he owned the record company, like that he managed Tracy, which was his record, which was Sam's record company. So, but he didn't necessarily own Sam's music. Right. I was saying in general, that's just the right. type of grimy type person he was. Yes. Um, and that happened to a lot of black artists, uh, you know, still happening now. To a lot of artists, period, because the Rolling Stones got jacked by him. Yeah, because they just don't know. You just want to make music. You just want to be an artist. And that's all you that's all you really want. But Sam saw beyond that. Sam was like, no, I, I, I'm an artist, but I want to own my stuff. I want to do all of this stuff. Uh, and before we started, Brandy, we were talking about Sam Cooke and his influence and um, how he would have like eclipsed Barry Gordy in Motown had he still lived um, because he was really about both sides of it, like being the artist, but also owning your artistry, sort of like Prince. You're like, I'm, I'm the greatest artist ever, but this, I mean- This was unheard of for a black artist to produce his own music, write his own music, do all these things. Like he was very much on the artistic side, but just as much on on the business side, the business side. So, you know he he was i don't want to say he was barry gordy before barry gordy to take away from sam cook but yeah it's, it, <laughs> that was that's the type of thing we're talking about <laughs> so uh sam uh has two funerals one in chicago and then one in uh la where he was eventually uh um, buried um i think it's at the hollywood memorial cemetery i think um but yeah so the mystery like keeps going because it's not that okay he's murdered in a motel that he shouldn't have been at that he would have never been at he had that five thousand dollars in his pocket when he left he didn't they never found the money girl girl took off with that yeah she took off with it so they're like it had to be a robbery because this is not what sam was about this is not the type of thing that sam would do uh the five days after uh, he's murdered, the, the little inquest and the, the case is officially absolutely closed in five days. Five days the case Bye. is closed. This is, this is unheard of. Um, 
Alan Klein. They've never proved that Alan Klein or Apco had any anything to do with Sam Cook's death. I question whether or not the FBI had something to do with Sam Cook's death because they did not investigate. And Sam was uh, very vocal about black civil rights. He was friends with Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X. So he, you know, he was in bed with a lot of the people that were being openly and investigated by the FBI. He refused to do segregated shows. Did yeah. Yep. With, um, there was one thing um, that he uh, he went to do a show and they separated the audience um, and he turned his back to the white audience and sang exclusively to the black audience. <laughs> Basically let them know you can't tell me who to sing to. Um, but I, he didn't do that. You know, he didn't do that. So he, you know, he was, his father told him, you know, taught them to really stand up for themselves. And that's exactly what he did the entire time. So I question whether or not the FBI had something to do uh, with his murder. I looked up uh, Sam Cooke, COINTELPRO. I did not find a connection there, but that doesn't mean that there isn't one. Um, yeah, because I did look that up because I'm like. Mom, give me one second. I All right. So apparently the FBI didn't have anything to do with, officially have anything to do with his death. Um, but again, that didn't stop the, the, the other stuff even after he was dead. Now, Remember I mentioned Bobby Womack. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you are into black music, your grandma and your mama love them some Bobby Womack. Okay. I happen to love Bobby Womack. Let me tell you what kind of deep down dirty. Mm -hmm, Peace stuff. Going on with Bobby Womack. So 77 days after Sam Cooke is put in the ground. His wife Barbara marries Bobby Womack. Now let's say Bobby was young. Bobby was 20 years old. They uh, uh, petitioned, they went to get a marriage license. He couldn't get it because he was too young. So they had to get permission from his parents to for them to get married. And his parents did not want him to marry her. 77 days. Remember that Bobby Womack was a part of the Valentinos, which were produced by, were on um, Sam Cooke's record label, produced by Sam Cooke. He was like a young protege. So listen, I don't, I don't know what y'all think, but within 77 days of somebody dying, somebody was messing around before them 77 days. Pretty much. I, bl I blame his wife. I do. I do. Because she was grown. She was grown, but again, we have to think about how quickly people became adults 50 years ago. Yes. He was, still, he, he, was still, he was still young. I get that here, you know, people are not as quite as developed as, you know, at 20, but 50, 60 years ago, people were adults at like 16 years old. Like they were doing adult shit at 16 years old. I mean, there's people doing adult stuff now at 16. I mean, Rita had a baby at 12. Are we trying to say she was uh, uh, yeah. 12 and 14? Are we trying to say that she she was old enough to be having a ch having a sharing at 12 and 14? But but that was that was common though. She well, she was that was abuse. That that was probably her daddy's baby. But what I'm saying is, you do know that people were getting married at 12, 13 years old. So we have to think about that. Yeah, but even then, even even then. That still was young. I we're not talking about out in the country. We're talking about a major city. But these were country folks married because you're getting a bushel, a wheat, and and a and a uh, a donkey. True, but you still have to think this is very close to the mig the Great Migration. So we still talking about country folks who live in the city. So they still have a country mindset. I'm not. I'm not condoning it. I'm not condoning it. I'm saying what it is. I'm she not. Condoning. She, just it like that, put that horse. She put some on it. Yeah, I'm not condoning it. She definitely took advantage of it. Uh, you know, I've seen a lot of comments talking about what well, Sam Cook was cheating on her. It doesn't matter who Sam Cook was cheating with. Still didn't give her a right to cheat with his protege, someone that was at his home all the time and that she would have been quite familiar with. Now, her and Bobby stayed married for what, five, six years? Like, no, let's not forget. 
Now, yeah. I ain't give Bobby too, you know, a whole lot of slack, but he wore my boy's suit to my boy's fume. Shut up. He wore Sam Cook's suit to Sam Cook's fume. Wow. Oh my God, I did not know that. The shade. The oh, shade. Oh, I felt that. Because you know that my grandfather's second wife wore my grandmother's dress to get married in. Yeah. Yes, bitch. The bitch you wore a dress that belonged to my grandmother. To get married. Wow. You know? Yes, girl. We almost tore that motherfucking house up. <laughs> the morning of that wedding, I, the morning of that wedding, I didn't, want to go. I didn't want to go to the wedding. And I was like, mm. my grandfather said, you know, you know, it's about me. You gotta come for me. And I was like, all right, daddy. I walk in their room and I said, why is that dress up there? <laughs> you know her voice. <laughs> yeah. What's the dress? I was going, I was like, this motherfucker. <laughs> in my family. Come in here. Come come look. Come come in here and look. Come look. Everybody come look. The, who dress is this? And at the time, it was crazy because my grandmother had taken a picture with myself and my grandfather wearing that damn dress. And the picture was hanging in the living room. Nobody, none of my, my grandfather's kids or grandkids went to that way. Fuck that. We ain't going. So I felt that in the spirit. Ouch. I'm sorry for going off script there, but I felt that. I did yes. not know that Bobby it's showed at that man's funeral in his suit, knowing that he was going to Oh, yeah, he was going it in, too, for sure. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Barbara and Bobby get divorced because apparently Bobby was going his daughter, too. Um, his daughter, Linda, Sam Cook's daughter, Linda, was 17 years old when Barbara walks into the room her and Bobby are in a very compromising position. She's 17. At this time, he's around 24, 25. And she shoots at him. She grazes him in the head. Um, and then they get a divorce. Well, according to Bobby Womack in later interviews, Linda never talked to her mom after that. So, I'm like, so this man's supposedly abusing you, but then you don't talk to your mother. Maybe Bobby was messing with her the whole time or something. I don't know. And the mom stole Bobby from her. That's know. definitely a great. Hmm. Right Bobby now. encouraged Barbara to sell Sam's music to Alan Klein. And, and that's how he started his drug habit because he basically blew through all the money. Because Sam Cook was quite wealthy when he died. Very wealthy. So he blew through all the money. He starts his use drug habit. Um, then, crazily enough, Linda gets married to Bobby's little brother. Chill. No, but you didn't say nothing about Vincent. We ain't there to Vincent yet. And then she uh, she writes music for Bobby Womack as well. So that relationship or some sort of relationship or contact with Bobby Womack continues after her mom shot him and divorced him in 1970. I think that her and Bobby was probably already messing around. And then the mama wanted to mess around with Bobby. And so she so maybe took... That she, maybe she was crushing on Bobby while Sam was still alive. Like the little Linda was crushing on Bobby when, and then somehow something... I and, don't know. Because she would have been 13 when they got married or thereabouts. And Bobby was 20. Or they could have been messing around during the marriage. I mean, you know, Loki or he, you know... I don't know. Definitely could be, it's definitely possible. Yeah. For him to just jump on the bandwagon. Um, now, again, with the scandal, uh, I mentioned that Sam Cooke had a son named Vincent, was born in 1961. He died dr um, of a drowning death, right? Barbara and Bobby Womack also have a son. They named him Vincent. What kind of morbid shit is that? See, this woman wasn't in her right. She wasn't in her right she mind. Been. You, and, and, and crazily enough, the, the second Vincent, Vincent Womack, killed himself in 1986. So you have two babies, both named Vincent by two different men, and they both died. How could you? How could you? The audacity. 
Me? Did Barbara go and marry somebody else after all this? I don't think so. I hope she stays single for the rest. Yeah. Rest, it okay. just need, it's time to shut it down. I don't think so. And then uh, Bobby Womack married twice after that. He he also had another son who uh, was a couple months old and who suffocated because he got wedged between the bed and the wall and the pillow and the baby suffocated. But it was because Bobby was high off his ass and they forgot that the baby was in there. And the baby what? Died. The and, that, and he says that that put him in a further spiral with his drug addiction. And when that baby died, that just sent him even further down the rabbit hole. I so, would think that would make me want to clean up. I mean, if I was really high when this happened, I would never want to be high to. I don't know. I just wouldn't want to be because I would associate that emotion, that feeling, with the murder of my child. I want to get cleaned up, but. You know, yeah. I wonder if he had any remorse of messing with um, old girl. I mean, he does have that song. I wish you didn't trust me so much. So if y'all ain't heard it, wish you didn't trust me so much. It has a totally different meaning after doing this episode. <laughs> He's talking about his friend, how he slept with his friend. He's sleeping with his friend's wife. Because they, they're in too close proximity. And I wish he didn't trust me so much with her. I don't know if it was written about Sam Cooke, but it's very close to the circumstances. And that would mean that he thought about that years and years and years and years down the line. You would have to. You, you, I mean, I don't think was you that why he started using drugs? Was it the guilt? I don't know, because his drug use really started when, his, when he married Barbara. Uh, you know, so I don't know. Um, how can you escape that though? Because the entire world knows that you married Sam Cook's widow in less than three months after he. And died. his career just tanked after that. Yeah, it I went. went he, his career, his career went through some ups and downs. He really didn't get popular to the late seventies, early eighties. Um, you know, to kind of shake that off, he has probably had a new audience by then, yeah. but. You can't shake that. Either. That's always going to follow you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And the fact that his Sam Cooke's death, even though technically it's closed, technically it's solved, there's so much speculation about that. And every few years, it comes up again and again and again with a new anniversary. Like uh, last year when a One Night in Miami came out, mm-hmm. you know, directed by Regina King talking about that very intimate relationship between himself, Sam Cooke, Malcolm X, Jim Brown, and um, who else was it? Um, and tell me what was uh, the football player. Jim Brown That's was a said, Jim Brown. Oh, okay. Um, Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali. So they had a very intimate friendship. So every time that, you know, things come up, you talk about start talking about Sam Cooke and this mystery. Uh, People Magazine did an article um, about Sam Cooke in uh, January of this year. And it's a really good article. Um, let me see what it was called. Yeah, I think a singer Sam Cooke shooting death nearly 60 years later. So um, they did a really good article in January this year about um, Sam Cook in the circumstances surrounding that murder. Uh, but nothing, nothing about that murder, about that night adds up. Um, because Alan Klein's company, Abco, owns the rights to the music, they basically own all intellectual rights to Sam Cook. All intellectual rights. So basically, you have to go through them to do anything about Sam Cook. So they have to approve everything. So all documentaries that people have tried to do um, about Sam Cooke, that company has basically stonewalled them. And that's really put a kibosh on the investigation, on further in the investigation. And in over 50 years, no one's talked. That's crazy that you have a murder that no one talks about, no new information. We have new information on, we just found out who killed Malcolm X. You know what I mean? We, you know, you find out who, who, you know, what was really behind MLK's murder. You find out stuff, you find out new stuff about JFK and RFK's murder. 
Mm -hmm. In the same amount of time, around the same time, but Sam Cooke, nothing. That's crazy. That's crazy. It's kind of like, what else? Who? What are you hiding? Like, what really happened? Who really killed him? And there's also conspiracy theory that he was not killed at that motel. That he was killed somewhere. Yeah. And they, I think. And they're saying that the shots are post mortem. That he was shot after he was already dead. I definitely think he was uh, killed somewhere else and brought to those. I, I honestly do. Okay, so even though everything is not adding up, you have the conspiracy about Alan Klein. Uh, you know, I thought about FBI. Um, who did his wife do it? You know, Sam is a wealthy man. She may have been already having, most likely having an affair already. Um, who who, who, who benefited most from Sam Cooke's death? Certainly not the prostitute or the motel owner. Right. No, they definitely didn't benefit the most. Um, his wife is a good answer. I mean, it's a good answer. You know? I mean, it, it wasn't like, it, it wasn't like, you know, he had got so much love from, you know, cops or anything anyway. Yeah, but, she pretty, uh, uh, but she does seem like a prime suspect. Did she marry Bobby Womack and sign over the rights so she can give him money so he can hush? Like, it's all of these things, wow. kind of questions of, about it, because you have to think who benefited the most mm. from his death. And also with the, with the hotel manager, if the girl ran across the street to go to the hotel manager's office, if he was in the bathroom, when she Take left, when she left, and she went and knocked on that door, and no one answered. Why would he go to the hotel manager's office? And no one staying in that motel heard any scuffle, heard any noise, or any gunshots. And even the people at the diner were like, "We didn't see anything." And as most prostitutes, they already know what to do in those type of situations anyway. And most prostitutes, I'm just being real, they're not going to call the cops. They either have someone that a pimp that handles certain situations or they leave the situation knowing they've gotten hurt because if word gets around that you're that type of person, that can mess up your work. So they are very known to just have to take. have been able to get payment from Sam Cooke later on. If she could have completely her, just, just went in on him. I need my money. I need my money. So the, it, it, the, none of that, none of that none of that makes sense. Nope. And did y'all know that Bertha Franklin used to be a madam? Mm. Yeah, I read that right before. That's what I was doing when I was up, right before we got on. I was like, wait a minute, what? But was it all a setup in the first place? Because remember, there was the gentleman when he first encountered Elisa Boyer. They were at the restaurant and there was a gentleman with her mm. that yeah. may have been a pimp or somebody. Then I I think Sam might have known the guy because he said he went up to him and started talking to him when the producer guy and the, his wife left. And it didn't look like anything crazy. It looked like, you know, he went up there. And, but again, that could have been the way to support a setup. But they also said that he thought that the hotel manager was in with the girl as far as stealing his stuff. Very so that's time. why he went there and supposedly started acting crazy. Because that's some place he had never been before. He had never been to the Motel Hacienda before. So why would he go there that night? And if she said, he, I told him to take me home, but he took me to the motel. When you got to the motel, why didn't you get out of the car? Because back in the day, you used to have to get out of the car, go to the manager's office, sign the register. Mm hmm and during that time, you didn't get out. The, the woman, even if she was a prostitute, get, didn't get out of the car with the gentleman. Nope. She stayed in the car. He had a Ferrari. Why didn't you get out of the car and walk away? If he was taking you to a place that you didn't want to go to. Why didn't you get out of the car and walk away? You were in the territory. You were a prostitute in South Central Los Angeles. You know the ins and outs and the alleys. You would have been able to get away. 
So it's it's just sad because just imagine what if he had lived, what could have been that we missed, what he could have been, or what we could have been inspired by. Yes, I love Sam Cook. His voice is just oh, it's amazing. Song, uh, well, one that we all know, change is gonna come. Uh, was released posthumously. Uh, it became like the anthem for the civil rights movement. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if y'all have seen Malcolm X, but they played that song as Malcolm X leaves his house and is on his way to the Audubon room where he is assassinated. Let me tell you. Somebody got onions in the room because that scene and knowing about their friendship and they play that song at that time during that scene is just like mm-hmm. because uh, Malcolm X was assassinated bef- before his wife got married to Bobby Womack. Sam Cooke dies in December of 64. Malcolm X is assassinated in February of 65. He said that that song was supposed to not really be just on Sam. It ended up being on Sam Cooke's album, but it was supposed to be on an album for the movement uh, with different artists on it. But we don't know exactly what happened and why it it was just released on his on his album. Mm -hmm. That song was supposed to be released on an album for the movement. And it, it's crazy how how that song kind of fits with with his death and with Malcolm X's death and Martin Luther King's death, and it's kind of prophetic, um, which makes it even sadder than it probably should have been. Um, but in 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 it, every time you hear it, you you kind of it kind of reminds me more of Malcolm X than it does of Sam Cooke, even though Sam Cooke is singing it. But it's mm-hmm. kind of, that I heard that song before, but I don't think that song hit for me until I saw Malcolm X. And then that journey that he took from his house to the Audubon room. Um, so when I hear that song, that's what I that's what I think about. I probably think about other people more than I think about Sam Cooke on that song. Um, the song that I think about more when I hear Sam, Sam Cooke is um, "Bring It On Home," "Bring It Home to Me." Ooh, good one. Yeah. That that mm, that song is on my playlist on my phone. I kid you not. I love that song. And then Lou Rawls is bringing up the, the bottom on that. Oh, mm-hmm. oh. Y'all, don't, y'all don't know nothing about no Lou Rawls. So, yeah, and he was pretty yes. sure. So, um, even though most people only know Lou Rawls for one song, he actually did sing the other songs, people. So, yeah, he had songs besides you'll never find. Brandy, don't, don't give me that look. He had other songs other than you'll never find. I'll send you some Lou Ross song. (laughs) Okay, Brandy, what's your favorite Sam Cook song? Um, Change is gonna come. I think that's my favorite. George Jackson same. It's just, it's because it's so powerful. I mean, it even resonates with my family. Um, like my uncles who are hardcore men, um, they are very <laughs> just straight country and hood, but it's something about that song that even breaks them down. So, you know, when they hear the, when they hear it, you know, it's something that they're gonna pull up to my grandma's house, like blast it, full emotion, you know, they just full emotioned into song, so it's a song that I grew up on, and it's a song. It's it's gonna it's gonna be my favorite song. It's still it's in my playlist. Yeah, it's, it's a great playlist. song, and it just it's just it's relevant. It's still so relevant all these years later, which is the sign of a good song, and also sad in a way. Oh, we're, we're still waiting for that change to come. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It's one of the songs that is. I think. Uh, um, has uh, become, uh, it's in the Library of Congress as one of, you know, like a heritage song. Um, it's very recognizable, but it's a song, I, I, I choose to bring it on home because I can hear Sam and just, just the way he sings is so beautiful. But if I listen to Change Is Gonna Come, I'm gonna cry. So yep. that's why. Like, I can be in a good mood and that song come on, either sung by Sam Cooke or Otis Redding, and I'm gonna cry. 
either one of them two sings that song, if I hear from either one, I'm gonna cry. So that's why I, I, I would have to choose another song as my, as my favorite song that I listen to more than anything is Bring It On Home. Yeah. It's a good song too though. Yeah. So nice. that is our take on the gossip session about Sam Cooke. Um, it's just sad that even after all these years, no one's talking. And that just makes me b believe more that um, something really horrible, some something really horrible happened to that man uh, prior to him dying. And I hope it wasn't by someone that he knew, that he didn't see them coming, that he didn't feel the betrayal that, you know, that we see. I hope he didn't know that. I hope he never knew what was going on behind his back. Even though he had children out of wedlock and that he was a womanizer, I don't care. I hope that he never knew that those closest to him were conspiring against him and possibly cause his death. Because that's a hell of a way to go down. So I have a playing in my head now, so I'm kind of like trying to yeah. keep myself together because you're talking about it and it kind of looks in my, my imaginary head of mine, it's a documentary going on. So it's like that song is playing and Brandy is talking. So that's why I'm saying like. So we will end this this uh, this week's gossip session. Um, <sighs> our song, All You Mind. Uh, next week, we'll be back with another episode again every Tuesday on YouTube. We drop new episodes. Uh, you can always visit us on Facebook and on Instagram to find out what we'll be talking about in the next coming week. So. Good night, y'all. Be safe. Good night. Enjoy this. Night.